you know, the Beaverhead, the Big Hole, Beaverhead, Big Hole, Ruby, Jefferson, um, over to the Upper Yellowstone and the Shields. Is that presentation up? Yep, you're good to go. Okay. Good. All right, so obviously this is a catchy picture. Um, that is a 13 pound brown trout and it was caught right next to a nine pound brown trout near Mallard's Rest um, on the Yellowstone this spring. I, I don't show that for the fish porn aspect of it. I show it for something I think is unique that we've seen bigger fish this year than we've seen in decades of sampling. And part of me thinks, and you know, others probably uh, maybe agree, maybe argue it a little bit, but in some regards, you don't get this big unless you have a low competition um, out there for food resources so you can grow rapidly. And I think it might be indicative to some degree of, you know, a, a symptom, if you will, of some of these situations we're seeing where there's less brown trout overall. So the ones that are remaining are growing faster in some cases. Obviously this fish is fairly old, um, but in, in addition to this, at least a 30 inch brown trout was caught on the big hole. And I don't think the fish has been seen that big in the sample since probably the 1960s. So next slide here. Maybe, why won't it work? There we go. So I, I started this out, I wanna kind of give some general overview that I'm, I'm talking about common trends observed in many, but very key to understand not all region three waters. This is not ubiquitous. Um, some of what we're seeing out there, there's, there's generally a common theme, but before I get into what we've seen recently, I wanted to speak briefly about some of the things we've observed in the last 15 plus years. And again, this, this is not unique just to region three. Um, if you, we've seen some shifts in distribution, some examples I can give you uh, prior to probably 2000, to see brown trout above Wis Wisdom Montana on the big hole was extremely rare, if not never had happened. Uh, that started changing. 15 years ago, and we'd see some large fish pioneering up there. And then for the, you know, the last five years, brown trout are now, now the most abundant trout up in that section of the river. Uh, it used to be brook trout primarily, and it's generally been, been displaced by brown trout. Um, years ago, when I worked up in region four, saw similar situations where Highwood Creek up in the High, Highwood Mountains, um, that all of a sudden brown trout were pioneering up to first order streams. Again, it's not a, it's not even a Montana unique situation. There's also situations down like in Silver Creek, although I don't have a direct uh, experience with it. I've read about it where rainbow trout used to be the primary fish in Silver Creek down in Idaho, and now it's primarily brown trout. So those kinds of distribution shifts have occurred and we've observed those over time. Uh, one of their anecdotes, as I will talk about the Yellowstone River, is this last year in the spring, we, we sampled at least one, maybe two, it might have been the same fish we saw twice, River Red Horse. And River Red Horse are a fairly cool water species as opposed to a cold water species. We have not seen them above Springdale or the mouth of the Shields River until this year, and it showed up nearly up to Emigrant. So there are some shifts going on out there. And I, in some regards, my theories on this are, we're seeing contraction on the lower end to some degree. And we can get into some detail and discussion on that. So the general trend that's been going on that we've seen in a lot of waters, again, not all of them, is an overall reduced abundance of brown trout. We're seeing in some cases, very poor recruitment of young fish, age ones, age twos. And then, just because of attrition of those or lack of those small fish, we're seeing an increased proportion of big fish. That doesn't mean it's all big fish um, out there, but in general, those fish have less competition, kind of back to my initial point, and they're surviving potentially a little bit better because they don't have the competition of the lower cohorts below them. So it's not a good, necessarily a good thing, uh, or doesn't, I don't want it to sound like it's a great thing. Um, because you know, there are overall lower fish, it's just proportions are going up in some regards. So I'm gonna dive right into the data and I'm gonna kind of progress from east to west. So the Shields River, for those of you that don't know, is a tributary to the Yellowstone in the upper, upper basin. It comes in just downstream of Livingston, Montana. 
It's an area obviously we've had decades of sampling, uh, quite a bit of variability. One thing I'll mention here is each one of these rivers is unique in its own way with a life history associated with these fish. Some of them are main stem spawners, their juveniles are in littoral side waters and back channels, and then we'll, we'll, we'll capture them during our typical sampling. In other cases, they may be in a tributary when we're doing our sampling in the main stem river, we might not see them until they become like two years old. Um, I see there's things popping up in the chat. And I assume somebody also checked that if I need to clarify or somebody can't hear me or something. Yeah, Travis, this is Hannah. Um, I can either interrupt you with the questions or I can just have, I can read them to you at the end, whatever your preference is. But yeah, so I think for general, one question. Generally for questions, let's wait till the end and I can always come back to a slide if need be just because of format. So uh, the Shields River, this is the upper, upper section that we've sampled. Um, you can see things have been down below what that long-term mean is. However, in 2021, the numbers were pretty low. Um, it was not a good estimate. In fact, I had to kind of twist the biologist's arm to put a number up on there just for context. Um, and what I mean by a bad estimate is we had very few fish captured and low recapture rates. And so we don't have a lot of confidence in that number and that's why the, the error bars are large. But you can see here that obviously a, one of the, now it is the lowest estimate since 1979 with again, that caveat that this number was not a great estimate and we don't have tremendous confidence in it. And these all should follow the same general trend. You're gonna see general population trends through time. And then you're going to see some information about length frequency. And again, what I mentioned a minute ago in terms of I'm trying to move this so I can read my, my slides. Um, in this case, you know, 2016 was the last time we were out there in the gray bars. We we're able to get an estimate completed. Um, and then in 2021, you'll notice those fish that are in the seven to 10 inch group. It's pretty much the same as it was. And this could be a situation, as I mentioned earlier, where those fish are those, those fish of that size, seven to 10 inches are still up in a tributary when we're sampling and they haven't recruited to the main river. So they're not there for us to catch. In other situations, I'll show you the, the suppression of that group of that age of fish is real because we typically see them. Okay. Oh, this thing's moving around on me. Okay, there we go. So now we're looking at uh, the downstream section on the shields. Sorry. Okay, we're looking at the downstream section on the shields. Um, obviously in the early 2000s, things climbed up, although those estimates are pretty variable. And so, but you can still see the number of fish in 2021 is pretty low. And again, I don't think the quality of these estimates were, were ideal. Similarly, you know, we, we didn't see a whole lot in 2016 out there for those juvenile fish, although they were there. We certainly saw fewer of them in 2021. And you can see in general how we don't even have that many fish between uh, 10 and 16 or 10 and 15 inches compared to the 2021 where, I'm sorry, in 16 we had more. And then in 2021, generally speaking, we got a few more fish in that upper group that larger size. Jumping over onto the Yellowstone River, the Corwin Spring section is the section that's downstream of Gardner, Montana. Um, things here looked a little bit better. You can see the 2021 estimate was still below average, but it's not horribly low relative to what we saw in the late 1990s in that reach. So that's encouraging. The size structure, um, it was a little better represented in this section of the river. This, this does have both rainbows and brown trout. So in this case, we're looking at the orange bars. Uh, you can see there's not great representation on that lower end. And then generally speaking, we see some more larger fish in that than those orange bars up in the 17 inch range. Moving downstream on the Yellowstone, reaching down to the Mill Creek section. Uh, the Mill Creek here, again, it's not horrid in terms of the estimate. You can see 1999 was certainly worse but it is below average and it's, you know, it's, it's lower than it has been and it's been declining somewhat since about 2014. Shifting over again, oh, back up one. This one's a, a really interesting way to look at this. I think it really it illustrates what I've been trying to say. 
So in this case, you've got 2020 in the orange bars, 2021 in the black, and that shaded color in the background is the average catch of those sizes that we have observed from 1981 through 2020, so a 40 year period. And focus in on the gray, the gray hat or area that's around the seven to 11 inch range. You see, we do typically see a decent number of juvenile brown trout in this reach when we sample it. And certainly 2020 and 2021 were, were low relative to that. And on the right side of this graph, you can see a little bit where, again, coming back to those, those three main trends we've seen, we see a few bigger fish or some more bigger fish than we've seen in the past. Okay, now I'm shifting to the upper Missouri. So we're going to the Beaverhead River upstream of Dillon, right below the dam here. In this case, this is the Hildreth section. Again, the graphs are gonna be different. Um, in this circumstance on the left graph, the dots represent the population estimates and the variance around those estimates and those, those little bars sticking up and down from them. The dotted line represents the portion of trout that are over uh, 18 inches long. I think it's 460 if I remember right. Um, and so, and I should say the other end of it, I think that's eight inch fish, 203 millimeters is what this is representing in those black dots. So you can see that things really decline fairly rapidly. I don't, can folks see my mouse if I'm moving it? Um, if you can't, I'll try to just verbally describe it. You see here in, in the mid 2015s, <clears throat> sorry, we were fairly high up to 3000 fish per mile and then it declined fairly steeply <clears throat> down to about a thousand fish per mile. The good news is the last two years, things have started to climb up. Um, similarly, the dotted line here, when we had 3000 fish per mile, our average fish were pretty small. The proportion of fish over 16 in, or 18 inches was, was lower in, in overall. However, in the last two years, that number has jumped up quite rapidly as you can see. And so on the, the length frequency graph here, again, this is metric. So 300 millimeters is 12 inches. Um, and, you know, in this situation, these fish grow faster than many of the rivers around. But generally speaking, this is a suppressed number of juveniles. And you've got some more larger fish up in here. This section of the beaver, we do try to manage for trophy fisheries. So when we have 3,000 fish per mile, as shown up here, and, and we're only, the average fish length is 15 inches. That's not what we want. We wanna drop that density down so we can get larger fish. So moving downstream on the beaver head, this is called the fish and game section. Uh, similar to what you saw in the last graph over here, we had numbers up around 1600 fish per mile in the early 2010s, and then the decline pretty substantially down. I think we're down to 400 fish per mile. Uh, this looks like 2019, 2020, and 21. And you know, it's creeping up, that's all within the uh, variance that uh, those estimates are able to be accurate at. So it's hard to say there's really a, ch a change there. The dotted black line, I think tells a pretty good story. It went from having somewhere around 0.5% or proportion. So 5% of the population being over 18 inches to now 25%. And on the, the length frequency graph on the right side of this figure, you can see again, not much representation of fish under 300 millimeters or 12 inches. And then you can see some larger fish up in the other end. Point Dexter Slough, this is an old channel of the Beaverhead River right in Dillon, Montana. Uh, we recently did a, a lot of habitat restoration in this reach. Um, when the water, in the past when flood irrigation was bringing water down the river, uh, it moved a lot of sediments, and as people have shifted over to more sprinkler irrigation, we don't get the same volume of water, and so that sediment was starting to build up in Point Dexter Slough, and it, it reduced the habitat quality and the fish population decline. You can see in the 2000s, it really went down generally. Um, like I said, the habitat work was done to narrow that channel up, um, remove some of those fine sediments, and, and get it uh, a head gate installed that we could send enough water down that channel in order to move those sediments through and things are starting to improve. You know, we were down around 500 fish per mile, a slight up increase close to a thousand per mile in 2021. 
this is a positive thing. And this is more on the right hand side, what one of these length this length frequency distribution should look like where your population is structured more by juvenile fish. There's more of them out there relative to the adults. Again, these are still, you know, that pulse, that peak there that's right in this area is probably 10 to 12 inch fish. And so those fish are probably still maybe pushing two years old at that point. Ruby River. So this is a tributary to Beaverhead that comes in right at Twin Bridges in Montana, in Montana there, um, obviously Montana. Um, but anyways, the Ruby, it's largely driven by irrigation system at the head end. You got Ruby Reservoir discharging water. Um, this vigilante section is in the most upstream reach right below the dam. So it always has good consistent water because of that irrigation. And you can see here, our numbers were up around 1,800 fish per mile in the 2015 to 2018 range, and they precipitously declined. And the 2021 estimate goes even lower. So, and similarly on that situation, you can see the proportion of fish that are over 18 inches long jumped up pretty rapidly. Um, similar, I think as I mentioned, low numbers of juveniles, um, higher proportion of adult fish and overall reduced numbers. So nothing really, this is fairly characteristic of some of those trends we've been seeing. Moving downstream, the Silver Springs reach, let me double check here. Yeah, the Silver Springs reach of the Ruby is the, one of the lower ends. It, it does have chronic dewatering problems um, because of irrigation withdrawals. And so the, the irrigators attempt to maintain 20 CFS of water in this reach of river. Um, and 2021, they, did, they were not able to, primarily because irrigation water was not coming down from the reservoir. And also tributary inputs was essentially nothing coming into the, the river to augment those flows. So we had to close this river back in May down in this reach. I don't recall, maybe it was closed for two weeks, flows improved. And then into the irrigation season with the drought and everything we dealt with, flows pretty rapidly got down below 20 again, down to somewhere around three or seven CFS. So that was these estimates, that last estimate there on that graph, 2021 was taken prior to <clears throat> that low flow, excuse me, I have to agree. Prior to that low flow that we observed in 2021. So again, similar situation, the decline, this has generally been declining over time, but one of the lowest or the lowest estimate on record as I recall from talking to Matt Yeager in 2021. Um, again, this is more characteristic of what I've described in those three, three um, summary points at the beginning of the presentation, very poorly represented uh, juveniles, a higher proportion of large fish and overall reduced abundance. Okay, I know this is probably getting tiring. We can certainly come back to any of these graphs that people wanna look at a little bit more, but into the Madison River, um, these estimates or these graphs don't show the 2021 estimates. I wasn't able to get those, but I, and I can generally speak to them. Um, you can see, obviously, we're below the long-term average for brown trout. I'm generally going to stay away from talking about the rainbows, but the brown trout are below the, the long-term averages. Uh, 2021, I, I think it was similar. However, our estimates were not of good quality, again, primarily because we did observe we had fish moving um, during our sampling period, which violates some of the model assumptions. And that's, uh, it, generally speaking, sampling brown trout in the fall is a, always going to be tough for that. However, we, we've done it in the Madison since the 1960s. So there is value there. But when we started seeing a lot of that movement, it really blows up the estimate. So even though we have an estimate for 2021, there's a lot of variance um, or a lot of variability into that uncertainty. But this is the upper Madison River. Uh, just 10 miles downstream of, of uh, Quake Lake. As you progress down, I, I, let me back up. You can see length frequency histograms. This is set up a, kind of similar, I guess, in a way that what you saw in Yellowstone uh, that by decades for the first two graphs. Again, this is characteristic of what we expect to see. We expect to see on the left side of these graphs, the smaller fish are more represented in the sample. In this case, these fish are rearing right in the main river. So we see them every year. And as you progress to the right, you go through the 2011 to 2020 period, not a whole lot of change there. 2019, you start to see some 
reduction generally in density across the board, but some reduction in those juveniles. Again, this is upstream of the town of Ennis. This is a, a pretty bulletproof area in terms of flow and temperature because of Hebgen Dam. So we're not experiencing some of the more extreme temperatures and low flows that we see in the other region three waters. But again, I think you can see there's a depressed number of juvenile fish in this reach to some degree. I would, uh, oh, wait a second. That was Pine Butte still. My, my apologies, that was still Pine Butte. So we're still talking about the section that's 10 miles downstream of, of uh, Quake Lake. And then I'm moving into the piece that's just upstream of Varney. Um, again, below average numbers overall on the brown trout. And then, Similar looking at uh, the distribution of the sizes of fish, not a dramatic change here through time. Um, again, this is pretty normal what we expect to see. We expect to see these juveniles out here. So the next one is, I, I'd almost call this a poster child for what we've seen. This is the lowest section on the Madison River. This is right where the, the, the tuber hatch occurs, all the tubing occurs um, and um, down, Oh, what's, what's a good landmark down there for folks that are around? It's just to the west of Bozeman, right when you hit the Madison River. And uh, you can see there's been generally longer term declines in brown trout through, uh, through this reach of river. And the, the number estimated in 2021, I believe, was the lowest estimate on record. Um, so, and looking at those length frequencies again, I think this illustrates, again, it's kind of the poster child, it really illustrates some of these trends more clearly or some of these um, characteristics than we've seen in other places. You can see the lack of juveniles there. There's essentially in this graph in 2021, um, you know, we, we hardly had any fish in our sample below 200 millimeters, whereas back in the 2000s, we, we certainly saw them down to six inches long. Um, so uh, they're, they're not there. Their overall numbers are depressed and a generally uh, lower or a higher density of larger fish that's out there, just as I've mentioned several times. Okay, a couple more slides here. Jefferson River, there's not as much data here. Um, same general trend. You can see, uh, you know, a handful of samples since 2006. Uh, this is broken out by age group, so it kind of gives you both density overall as well as um, uh, the size structure. And so that orange bar, age two fish, is really depressed from 2010 to 2011. Uh, I think there's one other section on the Jefferson. This is the Waterloo section. Um, again, showing blue is the fish between 9, 11 inch, tw 9 and 12 inches, which what Ron Spoon considers to be age twos in that reach. The orange is age three. And uh, on the right, you see a length frequency really kind of illustrating, as I've been saying all night, really not much representation out there of juvenile fish and a few more larger fish than we've seen, but certainly a pretty poor estimate in this time frame. The Jefferson is heavily affected by drought, similar to some of these rivers because of irrigation withdrawals. Okay, I think this might be our last river. Um, this is the big hole. So progressing again upstream down uh, the Jerry Creek section, I believe is above the canyon. You can see numbers have been declining both in number and biomass, which is just the pounds of fish per mile. And, you know, their peak time frame is sometime in the early 2000s. And our numbers now are, you know, a quarter of what they were back then. Uh, this one is, is kind of another interesting story, very similar trend. You've seen a decline um, since about 2014 down to, I believe, again, the lowest estimate we've ever done on the Big Hole River. And yeah, the interesting thing about this for some folks may know on the phone or on the call here is the 2015 when we peaked out. This is when we had an episode of saprolignia, which I know you guys have had some saprolignia, the fungus that grows on the fish over region two. Uh, 2014 and I think 2015, we saw large die-offs, which is very unusual, of uh, brown trout with a lot of fungus growing on them. And I'll mention this in a minute too, but typically fungus growth is a secondary response. And what I mean by that is it, the fish is stressed out for some other reason, and it gives the opportunity for the fungus to grow on it. 
Um, it is very common to see spawning fish beating each other up and running into rocks and digging to have saprolignia. It's not common to see the level that we saw it as well as um, having that level of mortality. Some dead fishes is normal. When I was on the Missouri, we'd see them pretty regularly down by Sheep Creek. So this one, again, this is a pretty, pretty poor numbers and the size structure falls that general trend that I've been speaking about all night, although I don't think I have yeah, I don't have a, a link frequency history here. This is the lowest section of the Big Hole River, the Pennington section, where we have not as much data. Obviously, we've only sampled this every other year since 2009 when Jim Olson began sampling there. The 2021 numbers don't look horrid down here. Um, they're certainly not great relative to what we have seen, but they're, they're not as poor as some of those other reaches. So again, even within one river, we, we've seen some variance in uh, most of these rivers I think you guys have seen, we see some variability in those responses. I throw this graph in, this is the Missouri River just upstream of Tostin, which is just upstream of Canyon Ferry to illustrate um, general trends in precipitation and which I, I guess it's a uh, correlate with precipitation. This is the amount of water that runs through that, that gauge over a year in August. And it's a departure from normal. So that zero is average. And you can see since 2000, almost all but three years have been um, below that average that has occurred. So long-term declines in flow, and that'll become important here in a second. Um, the one thing I would mention too is on the far right of this graph in the 2013 and forward, a lot of these flows are augmented because um, the power company is pulsing water out of um, Ennis Lake to prevent the Madison River below Ennis Dam, which is that Norris reach from exceeding 80 degrees. And so the true volume of water would be lower without those pulses. So it's been pretty poor through time. And, and declining. Okay, shifting gears, I guess probably should have, uh, well, I'll come back to it, but something we've observed more in the last couple of years, um, I've spoken with our fish health specialist and this, this uh, ulcerative dermal necrosis, I've coined it cheese grater head. Uh, again, there's, there are some fungus growth on these things. We don't think it's caused by a fungus, we don't know. We've kind of scratched our head, no pun intended here, to um, understand what could be causing this. You know, I mean, I've gone even to the thoughts of, are they getting sunburns on their heads? Um, our fish health specialist saw one of these fish over in the Clark Fork, I believe in two or three years ago. Um, and this last year, it really popped up on the radar more where we saw them in the big hole, the Madison, the Beaverhead, the Shields. And when I spoke with Chris Edgington a month ago, he said he saw one on the flathead. So it's, it's out there. It's been observed in brown trout in Europe. These are sea run fish. Um, in Montana here, we've seen them on obviously brown trout, rainbow trout, and mountain whitefish. However, um, you know, I, I guess the last thing, I did see a grayling in the big hole it was too far dead to really tell, but it kind of looked like it had something similar going on. Again, we don't know if this is just a reaction to some other stressor out there. You know, potentially there could be some new pathogen, although we have not been able to detect anything. In fact, uh, let me show some more pictures here. The picture on the upper left, a mountain whitefish that I personally sampled on the, on the uh, Big Hole River, and I was able to get that fish sampled in, in pure, in, fixative to return over to the Fish and Wildlife Service Fish Health Lab so they can try to figure out what's going on with it. Unfortunately, their fish pathologist quit back in May, I believe. And so we haven't really heard anything of what they've detected on that fish yet until they get a person that can look at them. Um, you can see the variance in severity here. I mean, those mountain whitefish in the middle and this picture's cut off. There's actually four sitting there in that same pool uh, their entire scalp, if you will, has just taken off and it's uh, growing fungus on it. Uh, I think my last slide is kind of a summary and, and I've, I've kind of beat the drum that obviously this is not something that's occurring everywhere. However, we are seeing some general trends, um, varying degrees in these different population estimate reaches where, again, I'll repeat it, the 
poor representation of juveniles, overall reduced abundance, and generally speaking, a, a larger proportion of, of a higher proportion of large fish. Um, we have contracted with the USGS to go through a lot of our data and do an analysis to try to help pin down more uh, clear causes of what's going on in, in these re reaches. And David Schmendling is on the phone. I know we have a report coming out fairly soon on that research, but the one major factor that is, is clear is that it's something related to flow. And again, when I say flow, it's primarily um, sort of an annual discharge, although certainly summertime flows are, are a key component of that. So I believe that was my last slide. Um, so I, maybe we just open it up to questions. I'll, come, I'll stop sharing. I can pull it back up if somebody wants to look at something. Hey, Travis, this is Hannah. Um, so I'll just read the questions that came in through the chat. And then maybe um, if people have additional questions after you answer those, then feel free to jump in as needed. Yeah. Is that, if that yeah. sounds okay? Yeah, it does. And I was going to suggest that David Schmetterling wants to add anything to it. He certainly could. He's on the call. Awesome. Um, so the first question came in pretty early in your presentation. Um, how many per mile from David Pritchard? So I'm not sure, David, um, if you want to unmute yourself and maybe clarify. Which no, I mean, he, expl he explained it well. I, but, but at least my second question, up here in New York State, the DEC uh, measures Lake Ontario brown trout. And they certain we have certain tributaries that come off Lake Ontario, and they measure the number of fishing hours on a, a given tributary. Um, for example, you probably don't know, but Oak Orchard is a popular one off Lake Lake Ontario, and they had like a record year this year, like 1.2 million fishing hours, and a lot of it's waiting, but it, it's not like drift boats or anything like that. So, do you do any type of gauging on how many? what the fishing pressure is is really my question yes yes we do david um, we have a statewide angler survey that's generally conducted every two years it's been done to some regard since the 1980s and the last we, we we typically do that on an odd year but because of covid we were curious to see if we would see a big drop in pressure in 2020 yeah 2020 so we did an estimate then um Overall, without having the numbers sitting here and showing them to you, angler pressure continues to, in to increase throughout most of all of these waters. I mean, there are some exceptions to that. I'm sure the lower ruby is, you know, just because of access is a little bit more difficult, but certainly the more popular fisheries, the, the Madison, the Yellowstone, the Big Hole, the Beaverhead, um, they're definitely seeing increases in use. Do you got catch and release areas there? We do now to some degree, um, our commission just changed the rules on the beaverhead, the big hole, that it's all catch and release. That said, the data we have suggests that there's almost no harvest occurring. Whenever we've looked at it, um, example being the, the Madison River in 2016, we did a drill survey between Hebgen Lake and, and Quake Lake primarily because of similar people had concerns that there were a lot of fish being harvested. And I think we saw two or three, and that, that resulted in an estimated like 18 fish harvested, I think. So generally speaking, we don't see people harvesting them. I, hear, I do hear anecdotal, I, I, I don't know if anecdotal is the right word, but I do hear some anglers saying they're seeing the COVID crowd showing up, harvesting more fish, um, which could be the case. I just haven't seen it. So the, the lead off a COVID crowd, if you look at population, and that, I'll just classify in three things fly fishing we'll say bait fishing and here in western new york or new york it's a lot of center pinning have you know what center pinning is center pin fishing it's a it's basically it's a bait thing but it's a very it's a very effective or lethal however you want to view it give an example in steelhead mm -hmm. 10 to 1 ratio you can catch 10 steelhead in tributaries compared to fly fishing with the center pin system. So I don't know if you've seen that in, in your region, that type of thing. No, I, not that I know of. My, I'm primarily, we're seeing fly anglers um, through most of these waters. I'm sure there are some people throwing bait here and there, but it's fairly uncommon. Thanks. Probably some hardware too. 
So um, another question in the chat, and then I can open it up to the floor. Um, any correlation with increased angler days and the decline in population, or is that too difficult to conclude based on other factors? So you kind of answered that um, in your yeah. previous answer, but. Yeah, we, I, I would expand a little on that and say that there is no evidence out, out there. It's never been researched to show where um, heavily used catch and release or non-consumptive fisheries, which I, that's kind of what I would classify most of our waters, um, has caused the population decline. No question, harvest-based fisheries have, um, but again, we, we have no data to know where that threshold is, where too much catch and release catch fishing is too much for the fish population. We don't know. All right, we have David, I think, could speak to that directly. I'm pretty sure there was no correlation um, that was detected with the USGS data at all. With angling pressure? Yes. Yeah, no, not a, um, certainly not a decline, but just like you explained with our um, pressure surveys, um, it's just, it's at a slightly different scale both time-wise and spatially than a lot of our monitoring data. So it's kind of hard to tease that out. It's not really how those surveys were designed. Um, but we are embarking on, a, on a, a different project to explore exploitation from angling and other sources on the Missouri and, and perhaps you know, wrapping in the Madison, um, doing a age-structured model soon. So that's another... Um, yeah, Travis answered that, that question perfectly, though we don't know, um, but it is something that we that we are going to be investigating. Awesome. Uh, two more questions came in through the chat, Travis. So um, Dawson tuning in from Great Falls. Thank you for all the information. Montana, no doubt, has spectacular fishing with lots of quality fish. My question is, why doesn't Montana get the consistent trophy fish 26 plus inch like Idaho and Wyoming? That's a good question. I can't speak to Idaho and Wyoming in terms of how they're managing. I know they do some stocking and I don't know what sizes they stock. Um, you know, I kind of mentioned this when I talked about the beaverhead in terms of trying to manage the upper beaverhead for trophy. If you go back in the 1980s, there were huge fish up there, a lot, and quite a few of them relative to now. And there's, you know, it's kind of a trade off. You either you either harvest some fish so the others grow faster and get bigger, or what we've seen over most of these fisheries is the recruitment and the, the, the fish coming into the fish population is, is good. We've got great you know, number of juveniles coming in. I'm, I'm speaking on average here. And you, you end up in a circumstance where the rest of them, because of the, the number of fish in the fishery, the growth is slowed on average across all of them. So long and short, you're not gonna see, you know, big fish and lots of them. You're gonna either have a lot of medium-sized fish, one or two big ones, or a low number of fish with some bigger fish. Um, the last thing I would say about that is if, if you're looking for those big fish, you know, some of the biggest fish I personally have seen in this state are in areas like the Sun River or the Missouri River in Great Falls, where recruitment, is really, really poor. Survival's poor. But if you do live, you have unlimited food supply. And so, you know, I would see 30 inch fish in those, those areas where there's, there's very few out there, though. I don't know if that answers it, but that's my general response to the question. Awesome. Um, and then last question in the chat, and then um, folks on Line, feel free to unmute yourselves and, and ask questions. So from Bill, thanks for this great information, Travis. It seems that fish are doing well if they survive their first year. Anything we can do as anglers to help that? You know, that's really where the flow plays in here. That's the main driver in a lot of cases in survival of juveniles in particular. And unfortunately, that mortality is probably occurring long before they're anywhere close to being big enough to be caught by an angler. Um, you know, whatever folks can do to help um, keep water in the rivers is a good thing. And the department works on those things very cooperatively with a lot of irrigators in particular to try to um, keep water in the river, improve irrigation efficiencies, different things like that. And a lot of those folks give up a lot to, um, to, to keep water in the river as well. 
big part of it, um, it, it ends up being, um, you know, climate. We need more snow and we need it to stay in the mountains until June when we normally would steer, see it come out. Um, I think, I hope that answers it. Um, in terms of, you know, the, like I said, the mortality rates for the different age groups, you know, when you're down to considering mortality of eggs um, and juveniles like the, the Alvins and the Fry, that's where the majority of it occurs. And again, for the most part, humans aren't influencing that whatsoever. Um, so. Any other questions? Hey, Travis, uh, yes, can, you hear, can you hear me? Yeah. Greg, Greg yeah. Thomas here. And I'm kind of wondering, you know, over time, I kind of followed the population counts on the bighorn. And it seemed like when you had low flows and the brown trout um, eggs were exposed, you know, at that mm -hmm. time of the year, it killed them. And you'd get those brown trout falling out of the population. And then you'd see an increase in the rainbows. And then it seemed to shift over time. And I'm wondering, I know you said you were going to shy away from the rainbow talk a little bit here, but are you guys seeing any kind of um, jump in rainbow numbers where they're going to take over that available space and that food supply? Yeah, I, I guess a couple of points, Greg. Um, to begin with, I, you know, I have seen some of the numbers on, on the big horn and I know that they declined in a similar fashion, but I think things look better this year. And the reason I bring that back up, I, I, I'm not going to speak for other waters outside of the region just because they're not my area, but um, one of the things that one of my biologists mentioned to me is, you know, we can all kind of explain these things on a local scale. Like we can say, well, flows were bad coming out of Bighorn or, you know, whatever it might have been, something happened on a local scale. But when you take a step back and look across the geographic scope, we're seeing similar trends. It makes you think about, you know, what else could be driving this that's bigger, that's affecting a larger area. Um, and the second part of your question was, uh, oh, rainbow trout. Um, you know, not really. We don't see, and you know, I guess you're asking if rainbows are filling that void. And I would say, generally speaking, no. We have seen some improvement in rainbows. You know, if you, I could show you the graph again, but that Norris Reach, which I kind of said was the poster child for what we've seen for brown trout, it's been declining for 15 years. And generally, the rainbows are going up but they're not I don't think that they're even above average at this point so not I don't think we're seeing any big replacement and it's one thing that always fascinates me about these rivers if you let's just take a ride here mentally if you go from the Jefferson River the lowest end of it it's primarily brown trout then you get up close to the top end you get more rainbow trout then your brown trout or rainbow trout start to decline as you go up the up the big hole until you get up around Jerry Creek and they come back. So there's there's localized changes in those uh, communities. And some of those are driven by things like spawning tributaries and, and things like that. But you know, it, we don't see separation completely, uh, obviously, with these two species um, geographically. And so I, I have no doubt there are um, situations like that where, but as you mentioned, the bighorn circumstances, they don't know that well, but you know, they're you, you can have discrete events that can certainly affect um, one or the other, in particular when they're spawning, one spawns in the spring, one spawns in the fall, um, that can influence that. And, and, and there certainly is competition and, and predation that occur that might change that distribution. I just don't think that, I, I don't think any of my biologists would think that that's, they're seeing that in region three. All right, thank, thank you, I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, Travis, just, if, oh, go ahead. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, here in New York State, we've had some droughty seasons over the last few years, and what we fish, fishermen noticed, I mean, like over in Vermont on the Batten Kill, certain parts of uh, things dried up, and the otters got the, to the trout, and other parts of New York State, water level goes low, and there's predatory birds that are protected so you can't kill them so and they were kind of going after the real low water for the trout any flying issues of birds taking over the lower the smaller fish with low water oh that's a great question um you know i i can't 
think of one that I have heard of um, outside of sort of our normal. Uh, our normal being, I know in the Jefferson River, there's a lot of those large fish will go up into two fairly small tributaries and pelicans will camp out there and they certainly eat them. I'm sure they're eating them more effectively with lower flow. But, and, and unfortunately, I don't have my staff here to, to ask, but I, I don't think anybody's noticed anything that would make them think that there's additional pr pressure. Uh, I would say I recall seeing a study from Idaho, I think it was on the Blackfoot River system, where they quantified to some degree the predation from pelicans um, on a spawning run, a similar situation, I guess, to what I mentioned on the Jefferson. And, and they, they certainly found much higher predation during drought years uh, relative to normal or better water years. So hope that answers it, David. Uh, well, if that's all the questions tonight, I appreciate everybody uh, tuning in and uh, certainly appreciate you uh, putting on this presentation for us, Travis. Uh, this has been an uh, interesting subject, especially uh, cheese grater head syndrome. <laughs> I'm not sure yeah. I'll remember the uh, ulcer, uh, whatever the other dish. Yeah, I can't even remember cheese either. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's an 80s uh, horror movie. So, uh, Thank you for that. Um, also, uh, appreciate your efforts to, to come uh, present to us tonight and uh, look forward to having an update maybe next year on this. Yeah, hopefully in person next time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, with that, uh, thank you everybody and uh, tune into our newsletter and uh, website and our social media pages for updates about our banquet and for other fundraisers coming up. Thanks everybody. Thank, thank you. you.